<coughs> so this morning they reiterate the, the attitude of relaxed attention Uh, welcoming receptivity let these words kind of just not not be imperatives or you know they, trying to do anything just as <laughs> as kind of helpful guidelines or comforting words, a sense of receptivity and openness rather than you've got to put forth the effort and try to get something or you've got to spend this hour, you know, trying to control your mind or uh, Get rid of negative thoughts. So the kind of the way that we 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 can oftentimes regard meditation as controlling methods to control and and uh, get rid of things we don't like. Trying to attain states that we would like. So it's like not having to do anything get anything, go anywhere, be anybody. Now th this way of reflecting uh, affects me quite nicely. It's uh, because of the, the tendency to, the habit tendency, the conditioning that was very strong of, of uh, you know, work hard, uh, practice hard. control, get rid of, and, and uh, try to attain the, the work ethic. The sense of, of relaxed attention, openness, uh, trust was, even though it, you know, I could understand the words, I didn't find this, but I found that this was, would create a lot of doubts because the conditioning of the mind was always around that hard work paid off and striving and trying and making yourself ascetic, more like an ascetic uh, style. Seemed like you were really doing something, getting somewhere. <clears throat> Where this other not going anywhere, not doing anything, relaxed attention, Sounded like um, something that that I would mistrust. Like, how could you ever get enlightened just by just sitting here and relaxing, opening? So that the the this of course this is the observing the thinking process, the the way the way one thinks. The personality then, Sakyaditi, is all is a creation of thought. You, you know, really, really explore this during this retreat. Uh, to become a personality, you have to create it. You have to think, I am this body. I am this monk. I am this nationality. Me and mine. I'm like this, you're like that. Now that's thinking, isn't it? That takes language. We each have separate names. So we separate us. I'm Ajahn Sumedho, there's Ajahn Panyasaro, Ajahn Natiko, Ajahn Tanya, they're they're separate from me. I'm Sumato, and they they have these other names. This is thought, isn't it? This is so. This notice that this creates separation, the illusion of separation of difference. Monks, nuns. This is a 
male and female. These are words, concepts that 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 uh, emphasize a certain quality or a certain condition or difference. And whatever, if you emphasize masculinity, then you've got femininity along with it. You can't, masculinity doesn't mean anything on its own. So heaven and hell, you know, is eternal heaven, uh, you know, is the idea of, like last night, talking about an eternal state of happiness and security that we can conceive of just by thinking of a place that's always this beautiful, stable, refined, safe, happy, loving, warm, comfortable. There's no nothing, no pests, no snakes, no worms, no mosquitoes. And so we can, you know, that's a, uh, then because of that, that's a superlative, that's a, a thought, those are thoughts. Thought can take, can take, can become superlative superlatives take thinking to the best possible thing you can think of but it also includes the worst so hell is the absolute worst that's that's worst and heaven is best now best and worst then are concepts words and they do affect us, because we, the, the desire is wanting the best and not wanting the worst. So with this relaxed attention, it's not, you know, the, the, because it's, it's an, an imminent being, it's not not a state that that I can attain through through a willful act. It's more like a surrendering, relaxing, trusting, resting in the moment, being here. As soon as I think I've got to relax, I'm too tense, and I've got to relax. Then, then the, the sense of myself, my separateness, and that I've got to, I shouldn't be the way I am, I shouldn't be tense. You can't really meditate properly if you're tense. I've got to learn how to relax. And then the whole, the whole uh, stressful uh, scenario takes us over. So you spend the hour here trying to relax. feeling frustrated because uh, you're expecting something, you know, something good to happen through, through holding the ideas, uh, having ideas and opinions about yourself or meditation or what I'm saying. So in the, this awareness, then, there's no self. Because, now, no, what, what I mean by that is, it's empty, I'm, I'm aware, there's awareness, but it's non, it's not, I'm not thinking, I'm trying to be aware, I've got to develop mindfulness, or I'm not making, creating anything, or identity with it, or or, or following any compulsive uh, tendencies I might have in, in the present. And just observing, witnessing, receiving. Listening.
But there is alertness, there is attentiveness. But it, it isn't. It isn't forced. It isn't, you know, concentrated on an object, trying to absorb into an object, or you, you know, doing anything like that. that it, this is just bare attention, attentiveness, openness, receptivity. It's more like not knowing the don't know mind. Uh, just repeat that to yourself, don't have to know anything, don't, don't know. The Korean Zen teacher uses that as a technique, don't know mind, don't know mind. But that's, a, that's quite skillful actually because there, there is, a, you know, the, one of the kinds of Dunha is wanting to know, have answers, figure it all out. And that sense of not knowing can be something that we feel very uncomfortable with. Because it's good to know everything, isn't it? And be clever and, and uh, figure everything out. But also observe this, like not knowing. It's just like like saying, if you trying to figure out what I'm saying, don't you don't have to figure it out. Just know that the the way I'm talking, the tone of voice, or the suggestions I'm giving affect you like this. It's this way. Now this uh, sound of silence then is what I is very prominent in the, when there's a state of letting this natural state of letting go. This is how I experience it. But then, if you know, if I, and some of you find this difficult because you you're trying to find the si a sound of silence. You know, you get the idea of it, and uh, and you think that you've got to to uh, to hear this, <clears throat> and so you're you're actually you know if you trust yourself just to observe the uh, you know if you don't if you don't even know what I'm talking about what is the sound of silence just uh, trust yourself to observe not knowing it and don't make it into a problem and don't look for it. Don't see any tendency that you have about thinking that you want to to hear this sound of silence, mm -hmm. or that you know I'm saying you should uh, practice with this or anything anything you might you know be picking up. Just uh, be aware of it. It's like this. What is the, you know what is the the uh, experience now that you're that is present. <coughs> Not looking for something that that you you can't you're not aware of that's not that, that you're not ob, you know observing at this time but imagining something you'd like to get. But it is empty, and it's not created, it's like this. No, this is noticing the way it is. This is like reflecting or investigating. This, this is 
when I'm with this sound of silence, resting in this state of not knowing, of just being, it's like this. So even the state of using words like state of being or resting, these aren't attainments or things to, to try to, to get. But if, if we use language, then use the language more or less for reflecting on the way it is. This sitting here, attentive, relaxed, receiving, is like this. You know, so it's like this is includes everything. It's not it's not like this as as something in particular. It's the way it is. Now then, this now this is uh, em uh, this is what I call emptiness. Sunyata. Now the, the word emptiness or sunyata is a Pali. I mean that that word is can become a kind of <clears throat> You know, we can think of it as maybe an attainment, or you know, we we form an idea around emptiness. But I'm not trying to fit this experience into an idea of emptiness. But you know, trusting the wisdom of the present moment, that this this sense, this openness, this receptivity. You know, it's, it's empty. It's not. I'm not creating anything into it. I'm not doing anything with it. Just being it, being this emptiness itself. So it's not thinking or an, an analytical, or critical or judging. Then noticing uh, non-self, anatta. <clears throat> if I start thinking, I'm sitting here listening to the sound of silence, then that's, I'm creating this uh, concept of myself as me, somebody uh, doing something now, practicing meditation. That's, that takes thinking, doesn't it? That's, that's the thing, I am sitting here practicing emptiness. That's not it. It's, uh, anatta, or say, trying to convince myself that you know, that I, I don't have a self, is still, you know, it's, it's not it, trying to, to uh, believe in anatta, or non-self. But this, this emptiness, this state of just being attentive in the present, resting open, the thinking process doesn't dominate anymore. So there's breathing and there's feeling and the things that are functioning, but there's no sense of a, a self because I'm not thinking about myself. I'm not creating myself. So then this is anatta. So then, non, uh, let's say, uh, non-attachment, desirelessness, viraga, is, uh, this is viraga too, I'm not, there's, I'm not attaching to any desires. Desirelessness is like this. 
You know, just noticing the way it is. For a desire to arise, I've, I've got to, you know, um, for to get lost in desire, you know, conditions arise into uh, certain conditions uh, that affect this being here, uh, desire arises. But my relationship to desire now is one of knowing rather than of grasping. So desires can arise with the, the, with this awareness, then one doesn't grasp the desires, the conditions and potential f for desire uh, is still present, but you you know desire. You're not trying to you know trying to get rid of desires is whipa vadana. It's called those catch twenty two problems, isn't it? They try. I've got to, I've got a desire to get rid of all these desires. And where, where are you going to win on that level? You know, you just go around in circles because trying to get rid of desire is another kind of desire. So what is the way out of the desire realm? The way, the only way you can get out of it is by observing it. Dana, gama dana, power dana, whipa dana, or the desires that come through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. So then if you start conceiving, I'm a person with a lot of desires, and then you, you're back into that realm again. I'm, desire is, uh, it's not, you know, then, then the word desire even sounds rather, you know, it has this pejorative. It shouldn't have desires. A good bhikkhu is desireless. Look at me, you know, full of greed and... But they, uh, so they, they, this desire, you know, the second noble truth, the core, the origin or causes of suffering. And this is to be, you know, the insight then is to to really know. You know, don't be frightened of desire. Study it. You know, if desire arises, really take advantage and observe it. It's like this. Wanting to become ambition, trying to to attain is like this. Wanting to get the jhanas, wanting to become a sotapanna. Don't be afraid of of these kind of desires. You know, don't don't go around thinking I shouldn't. You know, I don't I don't want to be a sotapanna, and, and uh, I don't want the jhanas. And uh, I'm just I just want to be like Ajahn Sumedho says. You know, just relaxed attention not going anywhere, that's what I want to, and that's a desire too, isn't it? <laughs> What's the difference, you know, when you're, you're trying to get the jhanas or trying to, to be, you know, what you think I'm, what you think I want you to be. <clears throat> so this is where the, the you know, you could really look at desire and, 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 and study it. Whippa wadanha. This the this strong urge to resist and control, push away, avoid. So examining whippa vadanha, you know, listen, listen to, intentionally listen. I, not wanting, I don't want this. I don't like this. I don't want this feeling. I don't want 
this, uh, these desires and these uh, bad thoughts, and I don't want anger and fear and jealousy and things. I don't want any of these. And so listening to, I don't want, I don't like, I, listening to this, this thing in me that wants to get rid of this, avoid, run away from. You know, so I, I even exaggerate it, see, you know, so that I can really know it. Take it so you, it's not just a kind of furtive acknowledgement of it and, and then try and, and then run away again, but really an interest in, in this avoidance, controlling, fear-ridden uh, tendency that makes me want to run away and get rid of or deny, resist things that are threatening or difficult. It's like this. The you know the more you you investigate this this desire dunha sensual desire desire for becoming the desire to attain achieve and these are quite noble desires too some you know desire to become a stream enterer is a good thing it's a good desire. So it's not a matter of of, of uh, criticizing or judging you know, it's good, bad, or right, wrong, uh, wholesome and unwholesome desires. Get to know desire, you know, desire is desire. Dunha, ubadana, the clinging, the grasping of it. So in, in investigating that point of grasping of dunha, ubadana, Upadana is a grasping or clinging to desire. So clinging to Vipavadanha is is being taken over by it. You know, like it seems a good thing to get rid of anger. So suddenly something arises, something happens, and I feel this anger rising. And then the, then the tendency to resist trying to get suppress it, deny it. And uh, it seems like a good thing, you know, that you shouldn't follow anger, speak in anger, or act in anger. And, and maybe what happened is, you know, is it, I'm just being unreasonable. You know, the, some little thing, uh, some little mistake somebody made, uh, uh, banging the door, or, or uh, it can trigger off some kind of anger. That I can be reasonable. It doesn't matter. It just you know, don't be so. You're just an angry person. I mean, you get upset by little things, and you shouldn't. You know, you you should be more patient. And so, you know, the inner critic is telling you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't feel the way you're feeling, or you shouldn't let things upset you like they do. And that's good, you know, it's true, you know, you shouldn't be angry over somebody, you know, slamming the door or, <clears throat> or you know, like yesterday, this, you see this uh, woman came in late offering the food and she managed to touch everything on the counter. <laughs> <laughs> When you're trying to receive it, the idea is once you offer the food, you don't touch anything. And, the, and she's trying to help, you know, by making room for this and, and then trying to. And I could feel this that sense of, you know, frustration. Of, don't touch the food. <laughs> and, she, and she was all, I'm making an offering, you know, which. <laughs> Uh, these are the kind of things, don't be so silly, you know, or don't be so, 
you know, fussy about the rule, the, the idea of being grateful for the, the generous offering, and yet feeling this kind of aversion to, you know, the fact that she, she touched everything. We shouldn't feel like that. And I don't like feeling like that, personally. But in the, in the, um, but then in awareness, you know, that, that this is the conditions for that particular feeling are present. So you're, it's not a matter of how, how I should or shouldn't feel, but just observing the way I am feeling, what arises. It's like this. Desire, upadana, dhanha, upadana, bhava. Then I become bhava, exploring this paticca samupada, dependent origination, bhava is becoming. And when I attach to desire, even the desire to get rid of desire, become a person again, somebody who doesn't want to have these these petty feelings, who doesn't, you know, doesn't respect the, this petty mood that I'm experiencing right now. And that's, you know, that seems like a, a noble thing to not to, to to really, you know try to get rid of the, this, this kind of meanness of heart or pettiness that might arise because I don't like it and don't want it. So it seems very right to suppress it or get rid of it. Or maybe it's opportunity, you know, how we look at it. Into To listen and and and, and not, not not in a, not th- through the critical mind. This is not a critical function, but observe. It's like this. Not wanting it to be like this is like this. And so this this gives the the, the uh, then this questioning inquiry that which is aware of this feeling of being annoyed or upset by something is awareness isn't upset and it's like noticing that the pure awareness doesn't get upset it we can it, it it's aware of of the feeling of upsetness So you begin to to differentiate, you know, there's the aramana, the the object. The dhanha is an aramana, it's an arom, it's, it's something that comes and goes. It's dependent on conditions. You know, so when the conditions for being upset, then this is an upset is the feeling or anger or greed or lust or or envy, or fear. So the awareness then is, is, isn't frightened, isn't lustful, isn't uh, greedy, isn't envious. Then I would ask myself, well, don't take my refuge in, in the aramana, in the object, or be the subject. How can I be the subject? Not by conceiving myself as somebody who's got to be the subject, because I don't have to do that. I am the subject. This pure awareness. This is. This is. This is. This is what I am. Pure awareness. And then the object of the awareness is the way it is, you know. So it's, it's, you know, it's dependent on the conditions of the time and place. 
So this is like exploring, investigating experience. From the way uh, you are too, you know, uh, the the kind of uh, character tendencies and that 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 one has. So then, the, if you, you contemplate this, you, you know, really observe this. This is a skillful means, I admit. You know, the paticca samuppada. But by using that that uh, teaching you, in, to observe the reality of in the present, <coughs> the way it is in the present, you know, the, then you then the, more and more you you're not coming from avicca or ignorance and and getting caught up in the in the endless uh, rising and ceasing of the conditions affecting you in this present in the present moment you begin to to appreciate just this emptiness this state of being natural state of resting attentiveness in which conditions arise and cease <clears throat> so then uh, you know this is a, i am this this so uh, this pure awareness, I am that, the Sagadatta's tome. Now then, I'm not claiming this as some kind of personal identity. So it's not, you know, that I have reached the ultimate truth and <clears throat> And then that that could be coming from, you know, me as a separate individual, me as a, this person. But with I am that, it's not. It's more. It's a reflection. That's not a statement of personal attainment or claiming anything personally. And even that is necessary. Say uh, I am that is is. is you know, go, f rises and ceases too. But it is a, a statement, a kind of affirmation to, so that this sense of being this increases, your, your confidence, the, the trusting in this awareness increases, connects. And then you, you're, no, you're no longer caught in the in all the kind of critical proliferations of your personality and your cultural conditioning and your emotional habits and the loves and hates, likes and dislikes that are part of human experience in and in a community, you know, where we affect each other a lot, living together here at Chithurst. You know, we can't help but affect each other personally, you know, just because that's the way it is. We, we come into each other's consciousness. We see each other, listen to each other, and all this. So the, this has an effect, you know, some kind of effect on consciousness. So it's not no longer, you know, leave me alone. Uh, we've got to get rid of the Troublemakers, uh, uh, you know, trying to control and you know, the situation, so that what affects me is isn't something too difficult for me to handle personally. You've got to make sure that anything, you know, any real challenging thing doesn't. Don't let them in the gate. Only the nice guys. Only let the nice guys in. The, you know, the good, the moral, the the giving, the generous, ones I approve of, in other words, <clears throat> that don't threaten me too much or make too many demands. <clears throat>
So in that sense of I am this, this awareness, this is a reflection. Again, I repeat that. It's not a, it's not a, an ego statement. It's just noticing, you know, using, using language, using thought, more or less to affirm, to, to make this significant, this awareness. It gives it a significance at first, that because we tend to not see and notice it as significant. We've spent maybe our lifetime not noticing it at all, being aware, just being, you know, habits uh, that we develop, lifetime of, of operating from the ego level all the time. So that's what, you know, we're, we're obsessed with our egos and our feelings and our views and opinions. So then uh, recognizing this this is they say this is my true self. And they, that's not Buddhist. You don't have a self. So when I'm talking in orthodox Theravada terms, I never say this is my true self. Because one time I said that in a public talk, and one of the orth or the or the guardians of orthodoxy wrote me a very distressed letter. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm I'm not so I'm not, I'm not trying to be you know I'm using language more for reflection than for accuracy on the on a on a, on a doctrinal level ways of of just bringing in uh, accepting noticing appreciating treasuring this awareness. Let's say it's like, uh, describe it as, as like a lover, you know. When you're in love with somebody, you want to be with them all the time. And when they're not around, you miss them. So this, this emptiness, this stillness, they, you know, the... the, the Rumi and these Sufi poets write about it as, the, you know, like the lover and that kind of thing. Well, it works also, you know, it, it does help to, to, you know, on an emotional level to really appreciate this is significant. It's not just all oh, mindfulness, you know, and, and, and just dismiss it because the emotional life does take on, you know, the, how I feel about you and you didn't do your chore properly and and that lady touched all the food on the counter, and and uh, somebody's always coming in late, and these things can dominate, you know, getting irritated, frustrated, or caught into all the worldly uh, permutations that go on in any in any situation. You know, so I tell a story about going off to the after my first vasa with Lung Po Cha, you know, too many monks, too much work, didn't like the work, didn't want to do the work, wanted to go off into nature. And uh, not live with all these monks and so forth. So I went off to Pupek Mountain uh, with two other monks. And there I pre managed for six months to to become obsessed with aversion towards one of the monks. This is a lesson, you know. Here I'm spending six months, and I was with two other monks, and the one that I had aversion toward wasn't there very much of the time. That also, I was averse to that. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't do anything right, as far as I. And then, then the rational self said, don't be so silly, you know, you must be compassionate and not be angry. And, and so I was trying to smother this anger, this aversion, and then I just become obsessed with it, trying to, you know, 
try not to be angry and be, be understanding and compassionate be nice about everything and get along and try and all that and then at the same time just you know feeling incredible aversion and, and resentment towards this one monk and it wasn't that he was doing anything you know that much it just was you know like I wanted a, com a life completely free from anything like that feeling. I didn't want that feeling. You know, and I didn't. I left Wat Bapong with all its monks because there was too many annoying things going on around me. And then, then went up to this place, nice place up in the mountains, and, and then I managed to to be annoyed continuously by this one monk. Well, that was an important lesson. I did learn from that. Because, it, you know, the desire, wasn't it? I desire to go to this ideal place, idealizing this place, and thinking that this is where the practice really is. I'm really going to get my samadhi and everything together here. And, and then maybe I might go back in, to Wat Ba Pong. But this is real practice that I'm doing. And so it's full of me, mine, what I want, what I don't want. And so everything, every little thing seemed to to aggravate, seemed to annoy me because I was I was so so greedy for this idealized experience, this perfect place. And it was probably one of the worst periods of my monastic life. So this is, you know, the the here in in in, in this place, where the chitters. You know, I've learned to just accept places as they are, and and the way things are. You know, just the, this is the, an acceptance of, of the way it is in the present, because this then. This is non-suffering. Not wanting things to be the way they are is suffering. I create that. I don't want it to be like this. That's the suffering. That's the dukkha. The way it is, even when it's not very pleasant, is still not suffering unless I get caught. I don't want this. I don't like this. I get caught into that. So then that this awareness then this is this is my true nature. This is my my real home. This is non suffering. So it's like really you know using the this way of of reflection not through, you know, deluding yourself into some kind of, you know, from the self-view, but using words that somehow give you that sense of trust and appreciation and this imminent ability of attentiveness. So you, you realize it, you you trust it, you rest in it, and then, then from this point on, then the then the path develops. You know how to really practice. You, you've given up. You know you no longer have views about how what good practice is or your ability or lack of it, because you're you've seen beyond just these these tendencies, the conditioning of the mind, the self view, the cultural preferences and opinion. Beyond the orthodoxy of the, of the tradition. Now this love never is always present. Sometimes, you know, 
where is it? And then just by opening, being present, I'm united with my lover. <laughs> Works every time. <laughs> This is kind of poetic, <laughs> very unorthodox way to <laughs> tell. <laughs> the point of it is, it's not to, not to become a Sufi mystic or anything like that, but but what pointing to the how to make how to uh, appreciate this, give it the priority in your in your. Life, you know. So this is this is this is where I'm at ease. This is where I'm. There's no suffering. This is the safety. This is this is home where I'm safe. I'm one with my lover. I'm at ease. Then I can deal with the with the changing conditions that happen around. You know. Comings and goings, the uh, days and nights, the weather, the the aging process, the praise and blame of the world. Because the strength is in this rather than demanding the world, you know, making endless demands on the worldly level that, you know, to to not upset me and not confuse me or threaten me in any way because that's that's an impossible demand you're you're bound to fail you're bound to be disappointed and despairing and disillusioned with the world because that's the way the world is it's not meant to be your home or your refuge or your safe place of safety It can't be, and it's not supposed to be. <clears throat> so, noticing then this, this is my real home. Now this, if you recognize this and then cultivating this, this is pawana, this word, Pali word, pawana cultivating, developing this in daily life. It's not a matter of just meditation retreat, but of <clears throat> just the, like here in monastic form and with the uh, tradition, with the vinya, the Theravada tradition. It's, it's a form, it's a convention for the worldly, for living in the world. But it's not a, not for attaching to the world, but gives us a way of of living in the society that is beneficial to one's own self and to the society. It's a non-violent, uh, based on you know of integrity and and uh, being content with little, not do not making endless demands or endlessly discontented trying to get more and more being uh, and yet being part of the society isn't it here we're still a part we're living in in this country we're part of this society and uh, then our conventional relationship to the society is, is one of compassion Love and compassion, rather than of just using the system or, or just complaining about it endlessly because the society isn't perfect and and we can see all kinds of things we don't like about it and and and, and dwell on all the faults and distressing things we see happening in the society and getting caught up into that. It's easy enough to do, and as a uh, the idea of a of the um, Buddhist monasticism is it gives you a, a lifestyle or way of living in society where say the right livelihood 
right action, right speech is, is uh, you know, is, is part of the, the way we live here. We're not avoiding or rejecting the society. I mentioned these other, like Sufism or Advaita Vedanta and that, this is, some people get upset if you're Orthodox Buddhist. <clears throat> if you mention other approaches, because there's a strong commitment. I've heard Theravada Buddhists say, it's only through the Four Noble Truths, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, that you can ever get enlightened any other way is, uh, is not it. I remember years ago, and, and start, when I became acquainted with Nisargadatta's book, I Am That, and, and then this, this very orthodox Theravadan came to stay with us in Hampstead, and he's, he was uh, from Asia, he's an Indian, and he and so, I, and he was a Vipassana teacher. So I asked him. I said, "What do you think of this?" And he took it. And the next day, he came back. And he said, "Oh, it's just Brahmanism. All they're getting maybe is the uh, is the uh, you know third jhana or something like this." So he <laughs> it was a typical Indian put down. <laughs> you know, um, you know, Indian Buddhists are oftentimes very threatened by Hinduism. So, you, you know, when you feel, when you're brought up in a society where you're a minority, an ethnic minority is a Buddhist, and then you see Hindus all around you, you, you know, you naturally develop cultural prejudices and fears. The same with the Christians in Thailand. If you want to want to meet rabid Christians, it's the Thai Christians that are most threatened by Buddhism. Because Buddhism is everywhere, and they're the minority, and they're brought up developing this prejudices against the majority. You know, the Buddhists—they're not—they're not. You know, so they worship idols and things like this. And uh, Hindus—they believe in gods and all that kind of rubbish. And the self—they believe in Atman. And the Buddha said, there's no Atman, there's no self. And those Advaita people, they, they talk about the higher self. And this self with a capital S, it's wrong, it's not Buddhism. So, I mean, it, these are, you know, this is playing around on the conventional level with the symbols. Now, what I'm pointing to is, you know, symbols are symbols, and it's how we use them, our attitudes, is, is the important thing. All conditions take you, uh, you know, if you let, if you really pay attention to a condition of any sort, it will take you to the unconditioned, because that's just the way it is. Now the the way to use the Theravada, the the Theravada approach is because it is has it's kind of precision tool. But then we can grasp it and uh, and form views and opinions about no self and all the other religions are not quite there and the and the Sagadatta has only got third jhana and. <laughs> <laughs> and, and dismiss the whole lot, you know, the Sufis, you know, they drank, they talk about drinking wine. You can't get enlightened if you're drinking wine, can you? you know, it's against the five precepts. It's wrong. So, I mean, it, you know, the whole logic and reason uh, uh, come from the, the thinking process. <clears throat> So uh, noticing this, you know, the, that's why uh, I emphasize so much getting to recognize the limitation of language and convention, and and that's their nature. They are limited, and they so that there's nothing. That's not a criticism of them because it's through the limitation 
you know, it, it simplification for one thing. The like the Theravada simplifies, but the aim is not to to become a Theravada Buddhist, but to uh, get to know the way it is, the ultimate truth, the Dhamma, to see the Dhamma. And so the different upayas are skillful means, uh, you know, uh, merely, you know, expedient means towards towards helping us to once to see this, to 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 rec- you know, your own character, your kind of the way you individually are. You know, uh, you, you get to to know how to use the way you are as a skillful means. Now you can't say you have to do it exactly like I do. <clears throat> that the way I do it is is the right way, and if you don't do it like me, you'll never get anywhere. That's conceit. Sounds like conceit to me. But you know, we have, the way the way I am, the character I have, how to use this. This is conditioned, but it, you you know develop awareness around these conditions to recognize, realize. The Dhamma, the truth of the way it is.